Eric. Yeah, Eric is here. Now. Yeah, we Hello. Hello. All right. So I welcome uh, Sanjay, Eric, Don, and Michael for the Ask the Expert panel. So here you go. <laughs> Over to you, Mike. Great, thanks. So yeah, so thank you all for attending the session today and thank uh, three of you for taking time to uh, participate. Um, so this is like an Ask the Experts panel. So it's very much hoping that the audience here will be um, participating and asking questions. Um, feel free to either add them directly in the chat or the Q&A um, page as well. So that's where I will be keeping track of the questions. Um, but I thought just to kind of get started, we could all introduce ourselves so everyone has a sense of kind of uh, who we all are and why we consider ourselves experts in the AI field. <laughs> um, and then um, we can start a a answering questions. If there aren't any from the audience, there's a few that we have prepared at least to kind of get the ball rolling. So just to get started, my name is Michael Clifford. I'm a data scientist, data science manager now, I'm working in the office of the CTO at Red Hat on ops problems. Um, and I will be moderating this session. Um, Sanjay, would you like to introduce yourself? Uh, absolutely. So I'm Sanjay Arora. I work uh, in Red Hat's office of the CTO, and we have something called the AICOE, AI Center of Excellence. Uh, so I work there. Uh, partially on scaling uh, and training of neural nets and training of reinforcement learning agents on our platform, so OpenShift, Open Data Hub, and partially on some uh, machine learning research projects with uh, Boston University, who we have a big collaboration with. Uh, Don? Hello, uh, Don Chesworth. I'm a data scientist here at Red Hat. Um, I have been at Red Hat for about five years, um, primarily in customer experience the whole time. Um, two things I guess I focus on, one being um, building classification models um, to classify text, and primarily what I've been interested in using PyTorch. And then the second, um, hoping to carve a path within Red Hat for data scientists to be more like software engineers. So a data scientist who uses containers, um, who sets up, I, I set up uh, my own CI CD, um, trying to get uh, most of my jobs to run an open shift, um, having APIs um, that do the predictions, things like that. Eric. Hi, yeah, I'm Eric Erlinson, um, and uh, I also work at the uh, AICOE at Red Hat uh, with Sanjay and Michael. And um, in previous companies, I did work in uh, applied AI, kind of like uh, starting really prior to the uh, advent of really open source AI ecosystems. and. Uh, did projects like uh, optical character recognition for uh, Arabic characters, um, or also some of the uh, early work in uh, AI for drug discovery. And uh, here at Red Hat in recent years, I've been focusing on um, helping customers and people internal to Red Hat uh, migrate their AI and ML workloads onto OpenShift, so getting you know actual repeatable um, AI workflows and application deployments. So in that sense, it overlaps a little bit with uh, what Don just talked about is, you know, really start treating AI and ML like first class software engineering. Cool. Awesome. Thank you all. So yeah, I think that I think the title of this talk today is real world data science. I think it's all of us are working on these problems of not just focusing on, you know, uh, what's it called? Prototypes or whatever, but how do you actually implement these types of tools um, into actual production applications? Uh, but cool, yeah, before we get into that, I think it's always like kind of a good uh, 
practice to kind of define our terms. There's a lot of buzzwords going around today, especially with AI, machine learning, deep learning, all this stuff. So I think just like a good starting question for the three of you, like what in your opinion is the difference between AI uh, and machine learning? And are either of them like different than, than deep learning in a meaningful way? Well, I guess I'll, I'll take a stab. Um, I think you could you can view it as like a set inclusion kind of uh, framework. You know, I, the highest level is AI, which encompasses a lot of technologies. Um, you know, like common machine learning technologies like neural nets or decision trees, um, but also other technologies that aren't really exactly learning models. Um, you know, chess, chess programs are AI, but they aren't exactly machine learning in the traditional sense, or at least the early ones were not. Uh, expert systems are AI. Uh, they were huge, of course, in like the 1980s. Um, not quite as much now, but you still see them. They still have, you know, a lot of domain uh, applicability. and. Uh, so, you know, underneath AI, there is machine learning. Again, like a lot of the big popular stuff now, and the neural nets and the decision trees, uh, nearest neighbor algorithms, you know, these are all machine learning models. Um, and then inside of that set is deep learning, which came out of the early neural network um, world, but of course extended it to much larger and networks with advanced structures and requiring larger data sets and new kinds of gradient descent technology to actually train. Yeah, and if I can add to that, the, the history is interesting. So uh, my dates might be off, so I'm, I don't know all the details, but in the 60s, I think, uh, you know, there was this huge optimism in, in all the sciences, really, right? Physics was making huge strides. Mathematics was making huge strides uh, in very abstract questions, on very abstract questions. And computing was. And so I think it was John McCarthy who, or the guy who uh, invented LISP, I think he was the one who organized this conference with the who's who of that day's computer science. And I think they had a very optimistic timeline. They said something like, in the next five years, You'll have computers that can talk and translate languages and play any game, and they'll be like humans. And uh, I think Shannon was in that conference too. And of course, you know, none of it panned out. Uh, and the question was, how do we start implementing something like this, uh, something that's like a like an animal brain? And people tried all kinds of things, but really, if you if you are mathematically minded, you open a math book, it looks like it's a sequence of axioms and then through logic you have theorems and their proofs and corollaries and lemmas and so on and so forth and so you said maybe it's logic right maybe if i define a few terms and i can implement mathematical logic maybe i'll just let it run and see what it comes out with and i'll have all these theorems and nice proofs uh, another stab at the problem basically said Let's define entities and their relationships and logic and concepts, however you define a concept. And again, let's try, you know, graph algorithms and let's invent new algorithms that can basically answer questions based on all the stuff I told the computer. And all of them had some successes, but they were limited. And then I'm guessing in the 80s, definitely by the 90s, uh, this uh, people doubled down on this trend where they said, let's just give it data. Right? So that was called statistical learning or now machine learning. Uh, and the idea was there are inputs, there are outputs, there's some mapping from the inputs to outputs that we don't know. Presumably our brain, like when I see the three of you, it's doing some mathematical computation and saying, you know, that's Dawn and that's Eric and that's Michael. And so what if we had an algorithm that takes a few input and output pairs and infers an approximation to that mapping. And that is really machine learning, right? That it's trying to find that mapping. And that leads to a whole host of interesting questions like 
what should the algorithms look like? So like Eric said, whether it's neural nets, decision trees, boosting, right, all these things. Um, and then there's a whole theoretical framework called PAC, probably approximately correct, which says, uh, which basically answers the question, if I give you a finite data set with some sample size, what's the probability that the mapping you learn from this finite data set generalizes well? It performs well uh, on new data set with high probability. Uh, so there was a lot of progress made in that direction. And uh, so in the 90s, it's, it was done in the context of support vector machines and you know, was, of course clustering and these are old techniques. Uh, and even neural nets, which fall in this domain of statistical or machine learning, which, which is data heavy. Uh, I think the very first uh, perceptrons came out in the 1940s, right? So during World War II. Uh, con nets, I think, were first invented in the early 90s, if I'm not mistaken. So many of these ideas weren't new ideas, they were computational challenges. Uh, but even with deep learning, the initial idea was, well, we know the brain has these cells, right, neurons, and there are these connections, axons, dendrites, I'm horrible at biology, and they connect. They connect. Maybe we should make a computational device like that. Uh, and just as an aside, yesterday, Quanta magazine, which is great for you know, popular science, uh, had some, uh, they were reporting on some research that a, a neuron in our brain is actually not at all equivalent to a node in a neural net. It's far more complex, right? So it needs, I think they said seven, eight layers or five to eight layers of a small neural net to actually approximate one node. But I think that's that's the global like way to organize all these thoughts. There is you know, the general fuzzy question of AI and we don't really understand intelligence. So you try and see what works. And then there's a very data focused uh, approach. And actually, like IBM, for example, has an IBM MIT Watson lab outside or in Boston. And they are trying to combine neural nets with some of the, the old symbolic ideas. So they call it neuros, no, what is it called? Neurosymbolic uh, neural nets or something. Yeah, I think so. Uh, I just and so these are you, open sorry, questions. Sorry, yeah. So you kind of touched on this. This is another question that we wanted to get to here. So like how, um, like how important is data or like what is the role of data essentially in these three different hierarchies of types of artificial intelligence, machine learning and deep learning? Like what is the, the role of data, I guess, in these different domains? Because it seems to me like initially we say AI can be these like rule based expert systems that don't necessarily require data other than a human. But then now as we go deeper down the funnel, the the data becomes more and more critical. Is that true? <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, I think everybody sort of by osmosis these days knows that, like, you know, data and frequently quite large data sets, you know, into the terabyte or petabyte range sometimes are used for, you know, some modern training algorithms. Uh, I thought I'd contrast that with like what happened with expert systems because I actually, you know, did a few of these back in the day. And, um, you know, I think you're, the way you phrase it, the role of data is a great way to phrase it because, you know, the kind of data you collected for those mostly took the form of interviewing other humans. Um, the general pattern there was you know, I want an expert system that captures some operational knowledge that humans are currently employing. And so the way you actually did this was literally interviewing, you know, human domain experts, uh, watching them work. Uh, and so it was a very different kind of data. It was a very, you know, human process where you, know, you, you as the, software developer, you know, you were interacting human to human with the experts and it was your job to really take all that information and 
code it up as a bunch of very explicit rules in whatever kind of you know expert system framework you were using. Um, so it was it was a lot like human speech in relationship to you know machine speech. It was very low low bandwidth, very small amounts of data compared to you know the raw hugeness of today's data sets, but it was high context. So there's a lot of, um, they were playing a lot of human context to say, oh, here's, here's the rules. Um, I, I'll never forget, we did this, um, we did this for Kodak Eastman <laughs> back before Kodak Eastman basically went under after the advent of digital photography. But like we actually interviewed a team of people who inspected film gels and at the end of the project, like the amount of the amount of code we actually produced was I don't know it fit on a screen I and mean, it was probably like twenty or fifty lines of code and we were discussing what that meant. <laughs> it's kind of like what, the you know the, the amount of the amount of data it actually took to capture what they wanted was very small in the sense of a very small amount of rules, but the amount of effort it took uh, to find that was, you know, quite extensive. It was several weeks of interviewing and discussing and coding. So um, it was almost the polar opposite of like what we do these days, which like Sanjay said is, you know, you know, throw a lot of data at something and find something that works statistically. Yeah, I mean, I'm, on that point too, I mean, we talk about like real world data science, right? And there is a I think a tendency to say, let's throw tons of data at this, this problem. We have tons of data. Let's throw tons of data at it. Is there any, like, or what are your opinions about like the quality of data or like how the data quality impacts, uh, the, your, even the ability to perform some, some machine learning task. I, I would, I think anyone who has worked as a data scientist anywhere has a very high failure rate in terms of projects. And most of it is driven by the quality of the data, which is either completely missing uh, or it's not labeled, right? Which is a big issue. So for example, we collect you know, petabytes of log files probably per day or per week in a large corporation, nothing is labeled. And so, yes, it is a lot of data on disk. What do I do with it? Right. And that's where I think it's not just the size of the data set, but uh, a combination of defining the appropriate problem. And that often comes from the domain expert, right? People who look at log files every day or look at radiological scans every day. And for example, a radiologist might tell you, I don't need a machine learning model for this. I can make this decision in five seconds per scan and I only get like 20 scans a day, so I don't care. Uh, so it's the, the problem which defines what data you need and what kind of labeling you need. And if you have good quality data sets with the appropriate labels for the appropriate problem, you, know, you might not need uh, you know, millions of images, for example. There's a lot of good data science you can do with like linear regression, which is I think unfairly maligned. It's one of the, you know, it's mathematically rigorous. It's wonderful. It works very well. It has very nice nonlinear generalizations like Gaussian processes uh, or tree based methods, like Eric mentioned. And so I think, uh, especially for people who work with data scientists, I would say when this, when you look at a lot of data, uh, it helps to work with the data scientists to define what they need. And what would you need to do to provide them that data so that it's still useful to you? I can define problems on log files that probably are completely meaningless to someone who actually wants to use it. it might be a nice machine learning paper, but I can't use, they can't use it. So I think it's that the data story is probably 90% of the cause of failures of data science projects. And it's mostly because there might be a lot of data, but it's not labeled or it's badly labeled or or the problem definition is so vague that you really can't do much. Yeah. So I have a uh, practical example I'd like to jump in. 
perspective on that um, just from this week. So this week, last week. <clears throat> um, so I'm building a classifier that is fairly, th theoretically, it, it seems fairly easy. Uh, just uh, three classes. Um, the difference between the three classes is um, fairly obvious, uh, theoretically. Um, so it was unlabeled data. Um, it's basically text coming in and classifying it into three different groups. Um, so we actually went through a maybe two month process of having the data labeled, um, a, a sample set labeled so we could train the neural network model. Um, and through that training, uh, we set it up as well as you would want to. Um, we took um, snapshots and decided, okay, what's the inner rater reliability? Like how common, we had subsets that multiple raters were rating. How common are the ratings that are they agreeing? Um, and then, you know, going back to the definitions of what we have for these three classes. So it was like a, a fairly sound process. Um, and my model is definitely better than the one before it because of all this labeled data um, and having humans in there labeling correctly. But my one class has, for its accuracy, these things we use for that precision recall, F1 measure, uh, is pretty amazing. One of them is OK. And the third one is sig significantly worse in precision and recall. Um, so I went back to the labeling and looked through it. And it's interesting that, I mean, it's, it was obvious to the people who are in charge of that process um, that the one class people were re really had a hard time determining whether something fit into that one or not. Like as humans, we are having a hard time. Is it really that or is it the others? Um, and the one that I had the lowest inner rater reliability, which is the phrase they use, um, is the one that the model is having the hardest time with. So yeah, um, it definitely nine times out of 10 goes back to the uh, quality of the data. And I'm here working on the quality of the model, like coming up with <laughs> 200 different models to try to find one that's accurate and yeah it leads back to even when we do have the time and the effort and the intelligence to label the data um, sometimes it falls short at that step oh, one, one yeah, thing I, we, I just one thing we did back when we used to do uh like optical character recognition stuff was uh it's kind of like what, what Don just said. It sounded similar. It was, you know, you think you have a feature set and you think it's good and it's not working that well on certain cases or maybe all the cases. Um, and it's like, well, you know, have, as a human, look at the feature vectors. It's like if I can't, you know, it's like I, I can't tell either. <laughs> and I think, you know, we, we as humans, we often just intuitively access channels of information that we're not giving to the models um, and like i think optical characterization is good for this because we just look at text and you know who knows what our brains are doing with that information but it's like the, the model's not seeing text the model's seeing vectors of numbers and so it's like you should look at those vectors of numbers and it's like you know that's kind of like the umwelt of the the model and it's like you often find it's like, yeah, it's like, I can't, I can't figure that out either. <laughs> so why should I expect the model to be able to do well on my crappy feature set that I can't even use? And actually, if I can add something to what Don and Eric just said, it, there's an enormous amount of weight put on predictions because we generally use these models for predicting something, but most data scientists don't stop at the prediction part. They don't say, my model's performing well, I'm done. Right? They say, OK, this day is done. Now, in some ways, the real work starts, which is, I want to understand what this model is doing. And of course, it depends on the use case. right? Sometimes you don't care. You say, OK, it performs well. I'll just put it in production. It's not a very high stakes situation. But often, you want to understand what it's doing. And that takes a lot of, there's no that people try to come up with general techniques and if it's linear regression or you know depending on the class of models there might be something 
but really that's very honest, you know, uh, low level scientific work where you try and understand what's going on. Yeah. I think to that point, I want to make sure we get to this question at the very least before our time is up here. But so we talk about, yes, like you get your model to do a prediction. You like the output results of your test sets. And now the real work starts. Like, how do you all like put your models into production at Red Hat? Like, what are some of the ways that, I mean, I think this is even kind of a somewhat of a green field or a new discipline about how what is the best way to actually productionize uh, intelligent applications or machine learning models. Um, do you three have any experience or uh, words of wisdom to give the audience about this this process? Um, yeah, I can I can jump in. Um, so I not knowing the range of our audience here, I would say like one thing to think about at first is whether you need what they call online or batch prediction. So whether your system needs a result immediately, meaning someone, a customer clicks a button and we receive that data and they need a response right away um, that's influenced by your model. That would be an online prediction model um, or what seems to be more common, at least at Red Hat, is that we can do batch predictions, meaning you get in the data um, from the day before or the week before, um, you run things on it, and then you provide the whole batch. And that's a lot easier to set up. I mean, you have a lot more options for batch processing, right? Because you don't have to be immediate within the stream of data. Um, and we have ones where, let's say you have um, reports or you know, decisions being made for the future um, based on your model. Um, you can do those batch, like you can take in a whole month's of data, run it, provide insight to your stakeholder, usually internal, um, and then they can uh, use that data. Um, so those are pretty easy to set up. You can run them just about anywhere um, as long as you can feed the data to your model and then feed the output somewhere. Um, when we're doing online predictions, and um, that's usually setting up an API, which is a self-contained thing that's sitting there listening, um, listening for data. Um, any, you, you set it up so that your system on an event, let's say the customer hits send or um, you know some type of event like that, the data would be sent via usually REST API into the model prediction thing. For me, it's a container. The container will receive that information, run my model within the container, um, output the uh, results back um, via REST to wherever it was sent from. And then that data can influence the next step in the pipeline. Um, so that one's harder to do, obviously. Um, it needs to be the latency is important. Um, let's say if it's in my area, customer experience, if someone at Red Hat opens up a support case, and we want that model to add the predictive value to the pipeline as soon as it can, so that our support associates have that added insight about the case immediately. Um, if our model takes an hour to provide a prediction, um, and our customer has an agreement with us that we'll respond within an hour, um, obviously, <laughs> we didn't help out at all, right? Um, so yeah. Um, yeah. And when you I'm talk, sure when you talk about implementing these things, like sounds like you're doing containerization of your or your models and things. Are you leveraging any um, tools like Kubernetes or OpenShift to make these things um, like the APIs accessible to the folks that need the results? Um, yeah, so I'm in this um, odd space where um, I'm trying to do what you might call cutting edge neural networks on GPUs um, and um, the OpenShift community, the Kubernetes community, um, I'm kind of one step ahead and they're one step ahead of me, um, like for example, um, I have a PyTorch model that requires a lot of shared memory. Um, 
Kubernetes, gosh, I got the numbers. I haven't seen the numbers in a while. I think 1.19 was, did not allow the um, configuration of shared memory. Um, so we, the AICOT, AICOE team, y'all's team put in a, um, a merge request for Kubernetes 1.20. It got in there. It's now in OpenShift 4.7. So like I keep running into those like chicken egg scenarios where I can't get an OpenShift soon enough. Um, but yeah, like most of the models that I have like are um, built in a way that they're OpenShift ready. Um, I'm running on UBI containers. Um, I do a lot of my, I do all my development within a container. And when I push my code, it unit tests within a different container and then it pushes it into a prod container and then I can run it in, um, we have an internal open shift um, where I can run my models. Cool. Well, we're, we're almost out of time here. I think there's there's one question in the Q&A, so we have to have to do it. Um, and it's a great question. Uh, do either of you think that quantum computing could take us closer to an AI system mimicking a human brain? <laughs> Any thoughts? That's, uh, that's loaded, but I'm going to go for it. Um, my... My own, my own personal opinion on this is that while sort of like it's, it's superficially and trivially true that brains, you know, obey quantum physics because everything does, I kind of think that brains, the quantum, quantum mechanics does not like deeply influence the way brains operate. That's my take on like what I've read about brain structure and how neurons work. Um, other people's opinions differ, but I guess my, when I read, when I read the arguments about quantum computing and brains, it mostly feels like, I don't know. Well, brains are pretty weird and quantum mechanics is weird and we're sort of superficially non-deterministic and so is quantum mechanics and so there must be something quantum going on and i'm not actually sure that's true i guess that's my my own hot take on that yeah in the last one minute i'll take a stab on the second part of it i mean quantum computing i'm a jaded person right so <laughs> i i wasn't i went to physics grad school undergrad right like 10 years and quantum computing was always one of those things which people worked very hard on and they were extremely good physicists building them. But it, everyone promised it will be out in three years, three years, three years. And one day I'll be wrong, right? But for now, I'll take the bet that it's like 20 years away uh, or maybe even 50 years away. But me, I, one day I'll, I'll be wrong and I'll happily pay some bet to someone. Um, on the second part, I think we, as far as I know, I'm not a neuroscientist. We don't understand the brain. Uh, we, we know bits and pieces of how it works. And I'm not sure if understanding our brain is a prerequisite to building uh, an AI system with some reasonable definition. Uh, the classic analogy is that of birds and planes, of course. We build planes that don't fly like birds, but they work because we understand the physics very well. And if we understood the mechanisms of intelligence, which is, I just said three words that if someone told me to define them, I don't know how I would. Uh, but let's say if we did, then maybe we could build something. But really in practice, I think what happens is the way someone, when I was an undergrad, described mathematics researchers, they said it's an infinite pie and there's a hole in the center. And you put a bunch of mathematicians and they nibble at this pie. And every now and then someone finds a blueberry. And then all the other mathematician slash ants go rushing towards that blueberry saying, hey, I found something. But no one today has any idea uh, whether you are famous or not famous or have a prize or don't have a prize on how to make progress on this. All of us have some beliefs. Most data scientists day to day don't work on this. But the ones who do, the machine learning researchers, now, even they have beliefs. Some think, well, reinforcement learning is what I find interesting. I have these concrete problems. I'm going to work on them. 
Someone else goes and works on symbolic systems. Someone goes and works on scaling neural nets to you know 10,000 GPUs. Who knows, right? It's just, I think, one of those things where people who work on this just have to keep nibbling at their thing. And uh, I, don't, I, can't, I can't predict the future. <laughs> All right, cool. We've gone over time here. So thank you all for staying uh, a couple minutes late. And thank you, Don, Eric, and Sanjay for being such great experts this morning. Um, yeah, that's the end of our session. I think if there's any additional questions, I'll be at least in this track room for most of the day. So feel free to reach out.